The Murray Firth's marine environment is wonderfully rich and diverse, home to an abundance of species and a fantastic natural asset for our communities, way of life and our action against climate change and nature loss. Across the Murray Firth and indeed the rest of Scotland, marine litter is affecting our coastline, coastal waters and our marine life. The litter which is washed up on beaches and the shoreline is a small proportion of what is either floating around in the sea or sitting on the seabed. We have a wealth of gorgeous coastal settings all across Scotland, and our sand dunes represent 71% of Great Britain's coastal sand resource. In fact, us that live in Aberdeenshire, Murray or the Highlands are lucky to never be too far from a beach. But make no mistake, marine litter is a global problem. Every year many millions of tonnes of litter end up in our oceans, making it the world's biggest landfill. Marine litter is an issue across every continent and poses the fastest growing threat to our marine life and coastline. On a local level, around the coastline of the Murray Firth, the marine litter issue is continuing to worsen. Our gorgeous beaches are being littered with eyesores, our marine life is getting entangled and consuming our waste, and there is a genuine risk to their survival. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are some fantastic teams and organisations trying to work with the government to tackle the issue. But they all know, as well as we do, that some of the accountability needs to be with us. One of these organisations that is doing fantastic work is the Marine Conservation Society. I managed to catch up with their Conservation Officer for Scotland to find out more about the ongoing issue in the Murray Firth and what exactly we can do about it. My name's Catherine, I'm the Scotland Conservation Officer for the Marine Conservation Society. So as the Scotland Conservation Officer for the Marine Conservation Society, I work mostly on the area of marine litter. So that's everything from helping volunteers get out to do beach cleans and take part in citizen science, collect vital data on the litter that's turning up on beaches in Scotland, and then taking that to use for policy and advocacy. So using that for speaking to politicians, for responding to consultations, and try and get different policies in place like banning single-use plastic, bringing in deposit return schemes, and moving us towards a circular economy. So a lot of you might have been onto the beach and you've seen litter washing up there and our volunteers are obviously picking it up and recording it. But how does it actually get there in the first place? Let's take for example that a piece of litter has been dropped in a local street or it's fallen out of someone's pocket. How could it get from there out to the beach. There's actually lots of different ways and we kind of call this story source to sea. So where it's been dropped, where it's come from, how has it ended up in the sea? One of the most obvious things is it could just be wind and it could be the weather that then blows it from the street directly onto the beach if you're living somewhere coastal. It could actually go down our drain system and what a lot of people don't realise is our sewage system is still connected to the sea and if we have high flooding or we've got blockages in the pipes because people are flushing things they're not supposed to, then pipes called combined sewer overflows still spill into the sea and that piece of litter could end up in the sea and then washing back up on our beaches as well. So no matter where you live, the litter that could be dropped or mismanaged could still end up in the sea, which is why we do need everybody to take responsibility and do what they can to make sure that litter goes in the bin and not anywhere that could then risk the ocean. Unfortunately, it's not just dropped litter that is responsible for the marine litter crisis. In fact, despite many of us disposing of litter in the correct way at home, there is still a chance that it could end up in our sea. So for a lot of us at home, we think we're doing the right thing, we're putting our litter in the bin and that's it then going out, but we're still sometimes finding that litter even from there can end up in the ocean as well. And there's a few other things a part of this source to sea story as well. So one, again, it could be weather, it could be bins overflowing, it could be spilling. There could be a bit mismanagement of the waste as well, that it's not going to where it's supposed to. And ultimately, we're also seeing coastal erosion around our coastlines. And we're also seeing a lot of landfill sites that are next to the coast are starting to be exposed as well. So litter that maybe was disposed of correctly years, maybe even decades ago, are now starting to turn up on our beaches and entering into the ocean as well which is why we kind of need to look at the story of litter in the whole and think of all the different pathways that that litter could be taking to the sea and make sure we can intervene and stop them now. Not all of the litter comes from us on land, of course. Some gets into the sea from out at sea. In fact, an EU report suggests that fishing-related items represent 27% of the total. 
So many of our volunteers, when they head out onto their beach cleans, they're finding all sorts of different types of litter, but they do find fishing related gear as well. This could be everything from angling line, from recreational fishers, to aquaculture gear, or gear from nets, or even creels as well. But what's brilliant to see is the industry have recognised that they know that some of this gear is entering the marine environment, it's potentially entangling or endangering marine wildlife, and it's washing up on our beaches. So there's a fantastic scheme that Chemo run called Fishing for Litter. And it's brilliant to see so many fishers get involved in that. We've also seen so many companies and different fishers as well get involved in our beach cleans and help support their local community. Nobody wants nets or gear or line in our ocean and it's brilliant to see people working together to reduce how much is getting in and how much is washing up on our beaches. Sewage and agricultural pollution also plague the UK's rivers and ocean. In 2020, Surfers Against Sewage reported that there were over 400,000 discharges of untreated sewage in the UK rivers and almost 5,500 discharges into UK coastal bathing waters. The sheer volume of sewage and runoff entering the water means that the UK is consistently ranked as one of the worst European countries for coastal water quality and only 40% of rivers meet good ecological status. The Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, or SEPA, found that more than half of Scotland's most popular beaches have been contaminated with sewage and breach of safety limits in the summer of 2022. Despite us as individuals not being responsible for sewage directly entering our ocean, we are responsible for what enters our sewage network. So what a lot of people don't realise maybe is you can actually have an impact on our marine environment from in your house and it's in your bathroom. So this is where we're talking about sewage related debris that our volunteers do find on beach cleans. Everything from wet wipes and sanitary towels to even nappies. And how they've ended up there is because people have flushed them down the toilet. And what people don't realise is they doesn't all just get magically put off to a sewage network, sorted out and cleaned up. These things cause massive issues in the pipes and they cause massive issues for water companies. So they can block the pipes and then as with climate change, we're starting to experience heavier rainfall and more flooding. This is putting additional pressure on the system. So the water companies then kind of have two choices. They can either back everything up into our houses or they can relieve the system through pipes called combined sewer overflows. And these then spill into the ocean. So whatever's been flushed can sometimes then get spilled. Some of them have screens and do try to capture some of that plastic and some of those items, but a lot of them aren't either. Now over the last couple of years, sewage spills across the UK have been making headlines. We know it's a massive issue and it is still a big issue here in Scotland as well. And we can all make a difference. So we can concentrate on what we're doing in our houses. Make sure you only flush the three P's. This is brilliant. Pee, poo and paper, that's it. Everything else goes in the bin. But then we also need our water companies to make sure they're doing their bit. They need to invest more in the sewer system, make sure they're monitoring these sewer overflows, make sure they're putting more of these screens in as well. But then we need businesses to play their part. We need to make sure that they're labelling their products correctly, not labelling them as flushable if they're containing plastic and they're causing these blockages. And then ultimately we need government to make sure that everybody is playing their role as well to stop sewage ending up in the sea and washing up on our beaches. Not all of the litter that is discarded comes from Scottish residents, however. Our vast tourism industry is also a major factor. Tourism in the marine environment is a huge industry and it has massive positive as well. People are getting connected to the ocean, they're getting to learn about the amazing creatures that live there and also it's a really important livelihood for many people living in our coastal communities. However, there is also concerns as well. For me, working in the world of litter, we found that during the pandemic, a lot of people reconnected back to our coastlines. They were spending their holidays in Scotland and visiting our beaches, but we saw a drastic increase in the amount of litter that was being dropped as well. So again, for tourism, the same for all industries working around our coastlines, we need to be making sure that there's no accidental consequences of having more people at our coast. Chemical pollution is also a majorly negative impact for the marine environment. Some of the most persistent synthetic chemicals available today, PFAs, known as forever chemicals, are having a major impact on our seas. So we've talked a lot about the litter that we can see on our beach cleans, but there's also hidden pollution that's impacting our marine environment, and a lot of that is around chemical pollution. So we've actually launched a campaign called Stop Ocean Poison, as these chemicals are poisoning our ocean and the creatures that live there. One group of chemicals we're especially worried about are called PFAS. They're also known as forever chemicals because they last forever and they're impacting our marine creatures. So what do we need to do? 
We need the UK government to actually bring forward a chemical strategy so we know what we're dealing with and to ban PFAS as well from all non-essential use. Another notable mention for chemicals that shouldn't be in our ocean is oil, and oil spills are all too common globally. When exposed to oil, marine species may experience reduced growth, enlarged livers, changes in heart and respiration rates, fin erosion and reproduction impairment. So more recent oil spills such as the 2022 oil spill in Peru should be equally concerning, despite the fact that it happened around 6,000 miles away. After all, despite the vast bodies of water that connect our world being defined under different names and jurisdiction, they are all interconnected and there really is one global ocean. The evidence of what washes up on our beach with each tide is there for anyone to see. More common in some areas of Scotland than others, however. To find out exactly what has been washed up on our beach, we need to speak to the people who devote their time to removing it. We recently just launched the 2022 results of this year's Great British Beach Clean, and in Scotland there's some pretty shocking results. So our volunteers, there was over 115 events across Scotland uh, that was collecting data. They actually recorded over 56,000 individual litter items, which works out at nearly 500 items per average per 100 metre of beach surveyed in Scotland. And we looked at that compared to last year, that's an increase of 42%. So we know that beach litter is still a huge problem here in Scotland. We can then look at maybe more individual items to help with our campaigns. So when we were talking about sewage related debris and wet wipes, they went up 150%, so still a big issue there. And we've also been campaigning for a deposit return scheme. So we looked at bottles and cans, and we found that 93% of beaches that took part this year found drinks related litter, whether that was metal cans, glass bottles, or plastic bottles as well. Now these stats are what's so important as they give us the evidence to go ahead and campaign and then ask people like the Scottish Government, Parliament and businesses to play their part so we can hopefully see these figures go down at the next one. So the litter that you find on the beach can actually stick around for quite a long time and depending on the material that it's made of actually then relies on how long it will actually take to disappear in the ocean. So for example, a lot of our volunteers find these plastic single-use bottles on our beach cleans. And because it's made of plastic, it's very durable, it's obviously made to be waterproof, so entering the ocean, it's gonna stick around for a long time. And scientific studies have shown that they reckon plastic bottles could probably stick around for up to a thousand years. If you think about how many of these we're producing, how many are littered and turning up on our beaches, this is gonna have a huge impact on our environment. So another item that's quite a common find are these aluminium drinks cans as well. So this is a different type of material, it's not plastic, it's metal. If we think about what happens to metal over time, it does rust, it does degrade. Aluminium is still a very durable material and these can actually take up to 450 years to disappear. Cigarette ends or cigarette butts also plague our beaches and we can find them in their hundreds as well. And once these enter the ocean, what a lot of people don't realise, they take a long time to break down as well. Maybe five up to 12 years. As lots of cigarettes, the filters are actually made of single-use plastic. So again, they can be here for a long time in our ocean. So crisp packets are another litter item that we find on our beaches. And these can actually last up to 75 years as well. So again, it's making sure that you put these in the bin so they don't escape out and end up in our ocean. So another type of microplastic is a primary microplastic, and these are called nurdles, and they're pre-production plastic pellets. So they're these tiny little pellets made of plastic that are then shipped off to be made into loads of different plastic products, from bottles to chairs to car parts. But we're finding them on the beaches as well. So our friends at the charity Fidra, they run the Great Nurdle Hunt. So when you're out doing your beach cleans, you can look out for these tiny little plastic pellets and then report back to them where you're finding them as they look like food for a lot of our sea creatures. So another thing that people find on our beaches are these balloons. So how are balloons turning up on our beaches? I mean, some people are having parties, but also it's the fact that people are still doing balloon releases, maybe to celebrate someone or in a memory of someone. And we're trying to say that there's actually lots of other ways to celebrate and you really shouldn't let go of balloons. Don't let go, because once they go up, 
they're going to pop and they're going to come down and they're going to end up on our beaches and they can actually stick around for up to four years as well so if you have balloons make sure you hold on to them around the Murray Firth however the concentrations of litter types differ slightly from the wider Scottish picture Recently the Murray Firth Coastal Partnership took part in the Marine Conservation Society's Great British Beach Clean. We organised beach cleans in Galsby, Cromarty and right here in Milton of Culloden where we collected some shocking statistics. In total we collected 935 items of litter over 600 metres, which works out at 155 pieces of litter per 100 metres, which is a crazy statistic. Some fantastic individuals and community groups that get involved with removing marine waste from our coast. One of the groups that do fantastic work in the community is Caithness Beach Cleans, founded by Dorcas Sinclair and her husband. I managed to catch up with Dorcas while she was out on one of her weekly beach cleans to find out more about what her, her husband and her group members get up to. My name is Dorcas Sinclair and basically just walking the beaches with my husband out for a stroll seeing the litter and just being really horrified at how it was building up and that's what started us picking up marine litter. We've always done beach cleans. Whenever we're out for a walk we would do a beach clean. However, in 2019 we started noticing that there was more and more litter arriving on the beaches. My husband would walk along, grab a rope, start tying bits to it, I would pick up a bucket start filling the bucket but in 2019 we decided to start a group. We hand out litter pickers and scales and we ask people just pick up when you're out for a walk. Don't, we don't do anything particularly organised. Just pick up, take a photo, send it to the group. It's a Facebook group and that way we have statistics and we know how much has come off of which beach and we just, we just weigh plastic. Mostly we find fishing related items. Um, times in the summer we will find stuff that's been left by party goers, beach picnics and things, but the majority, 95% is fishing related. Creels, boys, ropes, lots of ropes. Um, creel hooks, creel dippings, spinners, anything like that and we'd found 10 kilometres of strapping. Uh, that's the stuff that you see round parcels, the plastic, thin plastic strapping. Uh, big bundle on a beach. We found a kilometre of coaxial cable, which was very expensive to buy, but it had come loose from something, some marine shipping thing. Um, we find drones. And sadly, we find medication and syringes and things like that. But yeah, you can find anything on the beach. Your favourite thing about getting out on the beach and removing marine debris? One, the feel-good factor that you have after knowing that you've done a good job and you've seen the beach looking really horrendous and then you've been out and you've spent a bit of time and it looks so much better. Apart from that, it's just the sound of the sea, the waves, the fresh air. And it can be an absolutely horrendous day, but if you're dressed for it and you're warm, you just feel so invigorated. It's just, I love it. We just, we just go out, we try and go out every day. <laughs> just because it, it is a really good feel-good factor. The problem with plastic is that most of it isn't biodegradable. It doesn't rot like paper or food so instead it can hang around in the environment for hundreds of years. Plastics made from fossil fuels are just over a century old. Production and development of thousands of new plastic products accelerated after World War II, so transforming the modern age that life without plastics would be unrecognisable today. The convenient plastic offers, however, leads to a throwaway culture that reveals the material's dark side. Today, single-use plastics account for 40% of the plastic produced every year. Many of these products, such as plastic bags and food wrappers, have a lifespan of mere minutes to hours, yet they may persist in the environment for hundreds of years. But there are other solutions for unrecyclable plastics. In fact, there are many. One of the organisations that has been doing fantastic work with plastics is Greenhive. I travelled down there to the community workshop to hear more about their work with discarded plastic. Greenhive organises uh, beach cleans and litter picks and supports 
independent beach cleaning and litter picking that's going on in there. We take waste plastics, plastics that's either going to landfill or marine plastic pollution, and um, we can identify what it is and uh, we put it into new projects that uh, we're building. We recently, we, we now have um, two mobile infrared spectrometers and we often when plastics go into the marine environment uh, there's no identification markers on them so it's just all mixed together in this big soup so historically they they were just getting binned so we uh, we can actually identify what what the different types of plastic are or, or the majority of them that are um, coming out of the marine environment and from there we can identify the ones which we can use within the project to recycle there's the environmental side, which is where do we source the plastic from, how can we get it back into reuse, and then there's the kind of the remaking and the creative side where we do skill sharing workshops and um, we make things like uh, birdhouses, benches, flocks, uh, raised beds, that kind of thing. We chat about plastics, there's actually lots of different types of plastic. The trouble with when they end up in the marine environment is they're all mixed together and it's very difficult to separate them out. Uh, off, most products should have an identification marker on it which is the recycling triangle with a number. Um, often when things have been in the marine environment it won't have that number. In your different plastics you've got type 1 PET that tends to be your uh, clear drinks bottles, uh, also microwavable food trays, uh, type 2 uh, HDP. There's also MDP and LDP, polyethylenes. Uh, they're often things like, uh, it can be anything from wheelie bins to outdoor play equipment, right down to kind of uh, milk jugs and uh, lids, things like that. Uh, PVC, that's often used in plumber's piping and in construction. Uh, LDP, uh, low density polyethylene, uh, that's often bread bags and things like that. Uh, polypropylene, one of the most widely used plastics that can be used in everything from um, kids' toys to um, different packaging, um, plastic packaging. Polystyrene, everybody kind of knows that as what was used in food containers, but thankfully it's been phased out now. Um, but that can often be things like coat hangers as well, um, or kind of cheaper grade hard plastics. And type 7 is other. It's positive there's a lot more talk now about uh, recycling, about reduction, reuse which is, that is great, but if we look at the volumes of plastic that have been produced globally, it's going up. In fact, it's, it's looking like it, it could double by uh, 2050. Microplastics are of concern because of their widespread presence in the ocean and the potential physical and toxicological risks they pose to organisms. Microplastics can be ingested by a wide range of animals and have been found in organisms ranging in size from a small invertebrate to a large mammal. So what actually is a microplastic? And why are they becoming such an issue? So these items of litter that we're finding on the beach obviously break down over time and we now know that some of them can take years, decades, maybe even centuries to break down. But how are they breaking down? Well, there's a few different things. Once they enter the ocean, it could just be the chemical makeup of the ocean will start to eat away and break down that item. It'll be the wave action, it'll be the wind, there'll be so many reasons and ultimately we will start to see these larger items break down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Which means eventually they become something known as a microplastic. So these are tiny little bits of plastic, less than five millimetres, you need a microscope to be able to see them. But it means these items don't ever truly disappear, they just keep breaking down into smaller items, turning our ocean into a massive microplastic soup. So microplastics especially have now been found everywhere from the bottom of the ocean to the ice caps and even into our drinking water as well. So we need to be worried that this might not just be impacting our marine creatures, but it could be impacting all life on Earth. It is, however, not just a breakdown of larger plastics that cause these microscopic plastics to enter our ocean. Some of them are entering our seas from our everyday actions. So there's actually lots of other microplastics as well that can still end up into the ocean and some of them are in products that we might be using every day as well. You might have heard of the term microbeads that are used in a lot of cosmetics and toiletries, they're used for scrubbing, they're used for cleaning. 
and we actually gathered a lot of research about this in recent years and we managed to get the government to ban microbeads in wash off cosmetic products. But that's just the ones that are washed off. They're still in so many other products that are still accidentally being used and then they're being washed down the sink and they're entering up in the ocean as well. Again, adding to that microplastic soup problem. There is also a number of other ways microplastics enter our ocean from human action, vehicle tires, synthetic textiles, marine coatings and road markings. And these are all major contributors to the issue. Countless animals die every year thanks to littering. Animals can get entangled in littered objects and die slow and painful death. Items like broken glass, pins and other sharp objects present in the litter can injure animals who tread on them unknowingly. In our ocean, this is a much more severe issue as litter items aren't stationary. They're often on the move and can easily confuse marine species and end up endangering them. So one of the biggest impacts marine litter have on our amazing marine creatures in the sea is through entanglement, which is literally where they're getting tangled up in the litter, which then stops them being able to swim properly or to fly, get to where they need to go to, to feed or to breed. Now this litter could be ropes, it could be nets, but it also could be things like plastic bags, metal cans or ring pools as well, depending on the size of the creature. So entanglement is a big issue and can happen from small creatures right up to our ocean giants. The second main impact our marine litter can have on sea creatures is through ingestion, through them actually eating the litter that's ending up in the ocean. And again, this can be from really small items to much bigger items as well. And what happens is a lot of the time, they can't digest it. They're pro they can't actually process it. So it can actually fill up their stomach, makes them think that they're not hungry anymore. And sadly, it can actually lead to starvation of many of our creatures as well, which is why we need to stop this getting into the ocean so we don't actually accidentally start feeding sea creatures litter. So the thing with plastic pollution is no matter where it enters the marine environment, it could end up anywhere around the world. So we really do need the world leaders working together to tackle this issue. In Scotland, we do have a serious issue with marine litter and we need to be working with countries around the UK to be bringing forward legislation across the whole of the United Kingdom. We do see that there's hot spots of marine litter in Scotland in relation to sewage related debris across the central belt. So we know that there's work needed there. And we also know that there's work in more of our rural coastal communities to battle marine litter such as ropes and creels and aquaculture gear. So together we can do it and we can learn from other countries, but ultimately we need to be working together to solve the problem. What I learned while filming this documentary is that the devastating consequences of marine litter can be avoided. Eating and drinking on the go is on the rise. You can help by reducing your use of single-use items by avoiding them in the first place or switching to reusable stuff, such as coffee cups, water bottles and cutlery. Don't flush anything other than pee, poo or paper down the toilet. Flushable wipes are often not as flushable as they say. The wipes don't degrade as often as they contain plastics and are commonly found washed up on beaches or clogging the sewer network. Cigarette butts are one of the most common types of litter and should be stubbed out and disposed of in a bin. Butts dropped on the ground or in the drain can make their way to the sea through wastewater systems. They contain highly toxic chemicals which pollute our marine environment and also contain plastic in the filters which degrades at an extremely slow pace. Be responsible and make sure all items are discarded in an appropriate bin. If the bin is overflowing, hold on to your rubbish until you find a better choice. Keep your bins at home secure so materials can't escape from them. Use a brick to keep the lid down on windy days. As pretty and fun as balloon releases, fireworks and throwing confetti can look, these items have to end up somewhere and often get washed into the sea or pollute our land environment. Look for options that will have less of an impact like blowing bubbles or confetti made from autumn leaves. We live in a gorgeous country, we have a beautiful coastline and we are surrounded by an array of spectacular marine species and habitats. Let's appreciate that and make the small changes necessary to make a big change to the health of our oceans. Thanks to the data that our volunteers have collected, we've seen some brilliant wins from the sea here in Scotland. So thanks to data, we managed to get the 5p, now 10p carrier bag charge put in place, and we have now seen a decline of those carrier bags on our beaches. 
We've also seen bans on certain single-use plastic items, such as cotton buds. We've all seen it on cutlery as well. We hope to see those starting to decrease. And it's also starting to move us towards a circular economy, where we start to reuse everything and refill everything too. And it was thanks to our Beach Clean data that we've actually got a commitment for a deposit return scheme for bottles and cans in Scotland too. But there's still a lot to do and we need to keep that action up. I need to be done. There's a lot of plastic out there.